Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today I am coming to you live from Roots Tech 2014 in Salt Lake City. Well, actually not live. This is pre-recorded because I'm in the convention hall at the normal time that we usually have our videos. So that just means I won't be available on chat after the presentation, but I hope that you will still find this valuable. Today we are talking about African American Family History Research. It is Black History Month and I thought I'd do something a little more advanced or a little bit um, kind of in the intermediate level category as far as African American research goes. If you've watched some of my other videos about doing African American research, hopefully you'll just see this as a continuation or a way to build on that information. So with that introduction, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, let's just talk about the 1870 wall. So a lot of African Americans, as I uh, meet with you and uh, help you with your research as I travel around the country, um, have this real challenge. Uh, every ethnicity has their own challenges. Your challenge is um, 1870. 18, so it's, it's called the 1870 wall because um, that is the um, last uh, available census, if you're working your way backwards, 1940, 1930, um, and hopefully you are, you're working your way back through the census records, a decade at a time reconstructing your family, locating the parents and then the grandparents and then the great grandparents. Um, as you get back into 1880 and then 1870, some of you just stop um, at 1870. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is how to overcome both the uh, mental block about 1870 and then also the very real research challenge of that. Now um, let's let me just point you to a couple of resources along the way today. First is going to be our landing page for African American research. It is ancestry.com slash African American. If you go to that website you're going to see here that we have some resources available very specific to research for African American families. Let me just um, make some of my screen real estate a little bit bigger here and I'll scroll through this page and you'll just see um, a couple of things that I just want to point out. First of all, we actually have uh, search boxes specific to um, African American, finding African American records in census records in the United States. So as you're working on those um, censuses between 1870 and 1940, then this searching with this search box actually filters for people of color. Over time, the, the way that people of color were designated on the census changed and there was very little consistency. And so they may be listed as black or as Negro, as, as mulatto, as colored, um, any variation of that. Um, depending on where they lived and who the census taker was and who gave the census taker the information. And so we've combined all of those racial designations into one search form. So you don't even have to worry about that. Um, you can just worry about searching for variations of names, spellings, and, and birth and death or birth and residence information. We also have another search box here, um, so you can click over to this and it will search all of the collections on Ancestry.com that are African American specific. So there are some databases of records on our website that are that only contain information about African Americans. And we'll hi I'll highlight a few of those in just a minute so that you know what you're searching, but um, this will search all of them collectively. So that um, instead of having to search them one at a time. Over here on the left hand side you'll see uh, a uh, link to some of the videos that I've done previously about African American research. Just below that, you're going to have a link to download a research guide. That's going to take you to this PDF file that you can actually print off and keep with you as you do your research. If you're anything like me, I, I love having something tangible, a book or a checklist or a, a guide or something that I can set next to my computer as I do research just to refer to to make sure that I'm doing the right things. It'll actually walk you through some of those beginning steps that I talked about in a previous video about getting back to the, that 1870 census, um, some of the tips and tricks for doing that. So I, I really encourage you to download that research guide. Pay attention to it, um, read it, digest it, um, understand the information that's included there. Um, it's going to help you with your research so, so very much. 
So that's uh, the free resource guide, an opportunity to explore some specific record collections, um, and then to search for your ancestors. Some of the specific record collections that you get to explore here, if you just scroll down past that search box on this landing page, you're going to see here in what we call a rotating carousel. And so you can just click on any one of these um, to learn more about those kinds of records and what they're going to do or how they're going to help your research into your family history. Now, there are a few questions you need to start thinking about or asking yourself. The first one is, was your ancestor free or enslaved? Here is the 1870 um, mental block that sometimes we put up when we're doing research into these particular ancestors. Um, uh, most of you know your history well enough to know that um, the Civil War occurred in the 1860s and emancipation was declared in, 18, in, in the middle of the 1860s. And so from, 1860, from before 1870, in federal censuses, if your ancestor was enslaved, they were not enumerated in the census. Um, they weren't counted. Um, and that's a tragic part of our history, but the reality is that's what the records are. That's what we have to work with. And so a lot of you, even if you knew your ancestor was enslaved, um, have have not even tried searching previous census records because um, there's some assumptions made there. So one of the things that uh, you need to do is just search the 1860 census. Just double check that information. Even if your ancestor was enslaved, it is possible um, that they were freed before uh, emancipation. Uh, here is a page from a North Carolina census, Fayetteville, North Carolina, in 1860, where we actually see on this page here, um, in the race column, we're going to see um, a mulatto, a black, a whole, a whole household full of mulattoes, another black, more mulattoes, right? If you come down here to the bottom of just this one page, um, there are 27 white people and 13 colored people enumerated on this single page in an 1860 census. Now, I did a little bit of research, not enough for some conclusive evidence, but what it looks like is that there was a plantation owner who, upon his death, declared um, in his will that all of his slaves should be freed. And so here we have, in 1860 now, um, 13 um, freed slaves still living in this community some of them actually still working for the family, only now working as uh, as servants, um, as opposed to being slaves. So they're earning a wage, they um, have homes, they were freed before emancipation. And so think about that. Think um, Again, we just assume that emancipation is what freed all of the slaves, and there are circumstances, even in the South, of slaves who were freed for various reasons prior to emancipation. So just check the 1860 census. It is certainly worth looking. Um, if your ancestors do not appear in the 1860 census, of course, um, there are some other assumptions that can be made. But there's also some additional information that might lead you to other records. Was your ancestor literate or illiterate? And that is an important distinction because it might help, like I said, lead you to other records. In both the 1870 and 1880 censuses, there is a little column way over here on the um, right-hand side where you put a check mark or a tick here in this column if they were not able to read or write. So if there is no tick or check mark in that column, you can... Um, maybe start to surmise that they were actually literate. And um, that leads you to some information as well. Um, it was against the law to teach slaves how to read and write. And so if you have a literate ancestor by 1870, um, again, maybe they were freed a little bit earlier. Maybe there was some circumstances under which they were educated, and there might be some more records to be found for them. And then the other thing to pay close attention to when you're looking at that, those, at that 1870 census is such a critical, critical year. When you're looking at that 1870 census, pay attention to the other people who are living near them. If, you're, if you want to find your family prior to emancipation, then 
um, sometimes it's sometimes it's easy, right? Sometimes they they took the name of the slave owner. They're still living on the property. They're still working for the family, and it's easy to just go back a decade into that 1860 census, find the white family living in the same place at the same time with the same name, who has then um, a um, slave enumeration that lists you know people of your genders and ages in all the right places. It, sometimes that happens, but uh, a, a lot of us are not that fortunate in our research as we research some of these families. Sometimes um, the slaves who were freed upon emancipation actually moved, just left and, and got away from wherever it was that they were living. You know, they went to Texas or they, they moved west or they moved north. So pay attention to the others that are living near them in the 1870 census. Chances are many of those people, even if they have different last names, are people who were enslaved with them. And so sometimes if you can't find your ancestor, maybe you can trace one of those other people and make some of those connections. The example here on this particular image, um, here is an 80-year-old man named Arnold Smith and a 76-year-old woman named Phoebe Williams, and they are living together in a single household, right? Here is a, a David Lawrence and a James Phillips, a 76-year-old man and a 25-year-old um, man. Here, here is an Eliza Ratliff. She's 30 years old with a household full of children. Um, pay attention. What are some of these other names of some of these other families? Look at the birthplaces, right? All of these people were born in North Carolina. This 80-year-old here was born in Virginia. So start to put together um, or, or understand an understanding of the community of people that they're living with. Again, very many of those people migrated together. Um, those were the people that they had known all their lives. And essentially, though maybe not blood related, that was their family. And so learn more about them and you'll very often find ways to break through that wall to discover where they came from and um, get yourself back into some additional records. Let's talk about records. In the 1930s, during the height of the Great Depression, as part of the, a work program, the government sent some people around to interview people who had been slaves and who by 1936, 37, 38, still had um, memory and uh, you know, were old enough during slavery that by the time the interviewer, interviewer came in the 1930s, they were um, able to recall those memories to share that information. And so the WPA slave narratives are a really great resource for locating information about um, other, about plantations and who the slaves were that were on particular plantations. Now your ancestor, chances of the, chances of your ancestor being the one that was interviewed, really slim, right? I mean, obviously somebody's ancestors were, were interviewed, but it's very possible. I've seen a slave narrative that listed, I think if I counted correctly, about 72 other individuals, sometimes just by first name, but they would list, they would often talk about in, in as they were being interviewed, they would talk about the plantation where they came from. They would talk about who the other slaves were. Sometimes they would talk about what the different jobs were, the house slaves versus the field slaves. They would talk about family relationships. Um, I read one in preparation for this presentation where he talked about his family and how um, his, his master was a drunk and frequently got himself into trouble. And so to pay debts, sadly, his family, um, this man who was being interviewed, his family was split up um, to pay off the master's debts. But he talked about exactly where his family went. You know, his mother and his youngest brother, who was a baby still at the time, they didn't want to split up the mother and the baby, were sent off to Florida while he remained in Mississippi with another gentleman. And it just, I mean, heart-wrenching information, 
but super valuable for family history as you start to see the memories of some of these people come out um, and as they talk about some of the things that they experienced and endured and share some of the information about the people involved. And so on Ancestry.com, the database is called Interviews with Former Slaves um, from 1936 to 1938. That's the time period when these interviews were created. You can search by name. This will be just the name of the person who was interviewed, however. So what I would really strongly encourage you to do is if you know your family's from a particular area, just find the state and, and start reading through some of these um, some of these interviews maybe even read a, a, a lot of them what you're going to discover and you can just use these arrows down here let me just um, move, use these arrows down here to just arrow your way through one at a time there's a little index here at the beginning about um, the different people interviewed there's also an index here um, about illustrations and then we get some some old photos of course this is old xerox copies probably that have then been microfilmed and digitized uh, there's at the beginning of each interview it talks about who's being interviewed by whom they're being interviewed and then you get to the actual text of the interview they it's done in this um in i think the word is colloquial but um it's done in the language of the person right so so um they wanted to preserve the accents and the grammar as well as the information and so it might be a little bit um painstaking to read as you as you start to read and you have to figure out what it is that they're talking about um or what the word means but if you've heard people speak with a southern accent or if you go on youtube they actually have interviewed um, some elderly people throughout time and some of these states have put some of these interviews online and you can read or listen to some of them it'll help you learn how to read them a little bit better but they wanted to preserve all of that and so you're reading the actual language of the person who gave the interview and you'll see here listed um, she doesn't know where her parents came from and then she just lists her siblings Solomon and Luke and Josh and Stephen and Asbury and her sisters and her she remembers one of her grandmothers and it looks like maybe even a maiden name and some aunts and then she talks about what it is that she did and I just oh these are just again they're really heart-wrenching because of the circumstances but they are just this rich rich resource for understanding more about the time and place where your ancestors lived and maybe even getting information specifically about them. Okay, after emancipation, the government formed um, a, an organization, a, a bureau of the, an official bureau of the government um, to take care of freedmen. And there were records created by this organization and uh, the, these lots of different records. Ancestry.com has three different databases of records that pertain to this government organization that was trying to help freed slaves um, uh, integrate into society or um, you know, learn how to um, manage their own affairs. And so the first set of records is the Freedmen's Bank Records. And if you, hopefully you do this all the time. If you don't, let me just give you a little tip. Anytime you're looking at a database on Ancestry.com, always scroll down past those search boxes before you start searching. And there's going to be a database description where we give you information about exactly what's included in this particular database, why these records exist, how you can search them, what you're going to discover. Now, here's the thing about the Freedmen's Bank Records. One of the reasons they're such a terrific resource Back then, um, it's not like today. When you go to open a bank account today, you have to give personal information that identifies you, so that we, so that the bank knows who you are, um, as opposed to you know who the guy is who lives across town who might have the same name as you. And so things like signatures and social security numbers and all of that is what we use today. Well, they didn't have social security numbers back then, and many of our ancestors could not. Um, even sign their own names. Uh, I have a whole, I have branches and branches of my family who couldn't, who were so illiterate that every document I have for them is just marked with an X. They never even learned how to sign their own name. 
And so there had to be some additional information given to personally identify these people. And so these uh, applications for these, for these bank uh, accounts have a lot of really great information, including the name of their employer. Now, if they were opening a bank account in 1965 or in 1865 or 1866, right after emancipation, very often the employer was the previous slave owner. A lot of them hadn't moved on yet. Even those that eventually did move on, some of them had not yet moved on. It might include the name of the plantation where they work. It will include physical descriptive information, their height, their complexion, and then this is here's the here's the jackpot the name of their father or mother or and mother, um, whether, whether they're married, the place of birth, residence information, occupation information, the names of children and the names of brothers and sisters. All of this um, um, huge amount of personal information, again, because they needed to be personally identified and this was personally identifiable information. And so you find an, uh, an ancestor in this collection and you've got lots of really great information. I'll just quickly highlight the other two Freedmen's Bureau record sets that we have. Uh, we have the Freedmen's Bureau marriage records. These go from 1815 to 1866. So um, the, again, this government organization that was set up in 1865 after the Civil War was managing all of this information, trying to provide relief and help the freedmen become self-sufficient. Um, some, some of those who had been enslaved had married but they hadn't married legally. They had married within their traditions and customs. And so this was a way to legalize or solemnize those marriages um, in the sight of the government. Now, one of the things you might notice here is that this particular database does not have a search box. And that's because it has not yet been indexed, but we wanted to make it available online. So you can actually browse it by state. So we've digitized these rolls of microfilm. So you can come in here and you can actually then browse it by the last name. Um, come in here and again, you can go image by image. And I always encourage you to do that for the first oh, 10 or 12 images, just so that you get an idea of how they are organized. But once you figure out how they're organized, so for example, in this case, it looks like it is alphabetical by the last name of the groom. I'm at Alexander, um, and I'm still in the Alexanders, and you can see there's 846 images here. So I can actually just change this number. If I know I wanna jump towards and a letter, of the a letter of the alphabet that's later, I can maybe put in, you know, 453 and then hit go, and that's gonna jump me to image number 453. And see now here, George Harrison, I'm in the H's. And then again, I can use this number or these arrows to jump back and forth. So that's how you browse record collections on Ancestry.com. Whether they've been indexed or not, that's a good skill to have. The last set of records here are the uh, Freedmen's Bureau records of field offices from 1863 to 1878. This is kind of an eclectic collection of records, but again, if you find your ancestor in it, you're gonna find some really rich information. Anytime there was a dispute or a complaint, anytime there was an apprenticeship that needed to be managed or a school that needed to be set up, um, any of that information or any of that stuff that needed to happen um, that was the responsibility of this federal uh, government bureau uh, to help the freedmen. There was a ton of correspondence generated because of that. And so there, are, all of this correspondence is in here. You're gonna see things like letters received and sent, um, a register of some of those letters. If I come in here, their endorsements, hospital records, labor contracts, statistical reports from the schools. Um, every state had different um, information here, claimants, lists, letters. So your, if your ancestor may be listed in here and they may be listed several times, depending on what was going on in their community or in their life as they were trying to become self-sufficient following emancipation. A um, couple of other record types that I'll just mention briefly, Ancestry.com does have um, the 1850 and 1860 slave schedules. So if you're able to identify from some of those other records, the plantation or the, um, the slave owner, then you can locate the slave owner in the slave schedules for 1850 or 1860. S um, search by the name of the slave owner and it will list um, by gender and by age all of um, the slaves that um, 
were on, on that person's plantation or farm. And so that will give you a, a, a kind of a starting point to start to sort out families, to start to understand um, who else may have been there, what some of the, the other, other ages and genders of people involved. There are a very few slave manifests as well. Um, most of those are not going to be online. We do have some from New Orleans from 1807 to 1860. Um, and I think those are the only slave manifests currently in the Ancestry.com database. There are some other ways to access those records, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, the other record type on Ancestry.com that you're going to want to get real familiar with are wills and probate records. As I mentioned before, that, that um, whole group of 13 colored people listed on the 1860 census were actually freed upon the death of their master based on his will. And so wills are going to oftentimes provide information about um, whether they were freed or not, um, who who in the family um, received the slaves upon the death of the master and and it lists really specific information so the best place to find those records is in the card catalog if you just come in here hover over search click on card catalog type will into this title field and that's going to give you the list of wills that are available on Ancestry.com. You see here we have some from North Carolina and Virginia, more here from North Carolina, um, some from Tennessee. So some of those southern states, South Carolina, Kentucky, some of those, Virginia, so <laughs> I could keep going. Some of those states are included um, here in Ancestry.com. A lot of times these are just going to be abstracts, meaning somebody's gone through and abstracted the uh, information. Ancestry.com is in the process of creating a national probate index, so an index to all of the wills across the United States that have been microfilmed, and those will be available in the coming years, but for now, this is this is what we have available online. Uh, some awesome off Ancestry.com resources. Don't um, uh, ignore state archives. The state archives in um, any of those southern states in particular have got some really excellent, excellent resources and county record offices. State archives are often going to be where you're going to find some of the larger collections, some of the wills and probate records. You're going to find some um, slave manifests. Those are the kinds of things that you're oftentimes going to find in a state archive. County record offices are where you're going to find things like marriages and births recorded, where you're also going to find things like property records. Um, the, I always hate saying that, but um, the, the reality is, is that during that time period prior to emancipation, um, those that were enslaved were viewed as property. And so they're oftentimes recorded in property records. Tax, they're, they're recorded in tax lists. Uh, and so those are the kinds of things that are held in county records record offices. So if you happen to know the county where your ancestor was from, Google the name of the county record office, see what they've put online. Some of them have put some information, digitized it, and put it online themselves. Some of them actually will just have a catalog on their website, and that will give you the information you need to know to either write or visit that county record office to access that information. There is um, also just one other website that I want to mention, that's Low Country Africana. Um, they have been collecting resources for African American genealogy and history in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, and they've got some records digitized. Um, if you come in here and go to resources by state, you'll see they have some slaveholder records, they have some additional freedmen records, some of the same records we have on Ancestry.com, but also some unique content. And so LowCountryAfricana.com is a really excellent um, resource as well. Final thing I just want to talk about briefly is DNA. Uh, if you have not yet taken the Ancestry DNA test, I would strongly encourage you to do that. Get your DNA into our database. 250,000 other people have taken that test, and you'll start very quickly once you get your test. Besides getting an ethnic breakdown of where exactly um, in Africa your family may have originated from, and some of you may come from, you know, some of you may carry DNA from several regions of Africa, um, you'll also start to make connections with um, third and fourth and fifth cousins who you can then work with and collaborate with. Um, you'll start to notice patterns in some of your cousin matches um, and understanding that will help you discover where they were before 1870. Uh, Ancestry DNA, I just cannot recommend it enough to help with that 1870 wall.
Well, that is all I have prepared for you today. I hope that that was useful information. I feel like I threw a whole bunch of information at you. Um, you might want to watch the video again, even without sound, just to just kind of absorb all the information available to you, be reminded of all the databases. I will try to get a blog post up as well, just to list some of these resources with links. But for sure, for sure, check out that Ancestry.com slash African American landing page. Most of what I talked about today, you're going to find referenced there or in in the resource guide, um, the downloadable, that downloadable PDF available there. Uh, just a reminder again, this is a pre recorded video. It's not live today, so I will not be available on chat after the presentation. I will actually be in the exhibit hall at the Roots Tech Conference during our regularly scheduled time. But I will join you next time. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.